Um, my name is Annika Dean and I'm with the American Cancer Society and Cancer Control Strategic Partnership Manager. Um, as a, a member of the American Cancer Society, work uh, closely with VHIT and um, our organization uh, planning these, these events and the agenda Today, uh, we're going to go through some introductions and a highlight of the future learning opportunities, a knowledge check, and then the didactic presentation with Dr. Nickerson, and then we'll have a question and answer session um, following that. Uh, VIHA is a statewide task force. Um, the priority, it's a priority subcommittee of the Cancer Action Coalition of Virginia, also known as CACV. Uh, VHIT consists of three committees, um, providers and systems, and, and the oral and school health committee too. The oral committee we're uh, developing and working through. Um, and we focus on facilitating various, uh, working with various stakeholders across the Commonwealth of Virginia to promote HPV immunization as a form of cancer prevention. So you can see our team of organizers here with uh, Janae at Virginia Department of Health. And then we have a number of partners from the American Cancer Society, as well as um, Erica joining us from the Virginia Health Catalyst. And um, then you can see our partner organizations who are supporting us and uh, helping promote and also provide speakers throughout this series um, of our, our presentation. So this is, um, as we mentioned, the peer-to-peer uh, -peer provider education series is an opportunity to continue this conversation and really engaging with our providers um, across the state. And we do have a series uh, scheduled with a, uh, we have a poster at the end of the, at the end of the presentation, um, but we would love to hear more uh, from what you guys want to learn about regarding HPV, um, HPV vaccinations, and to also share this with your colleagues. We're really wanting to um, engage more participation on these, um, on these events moving forward. So we'll have them the first Wednesday of every month through June, and then another one in August. So our knowledge check, uh, we are going to just, um, uh, it's just, excuse me, true and false questions, uh, but please put your answers in the chat box in the first question. And I apologize for the formatting issue. Um, HPV is only transmitted sexually. Second question. I have, only high risk sexual behaviors are associated with HPV related anal or colorectal cancers. All right, third question. The incidence of anal cancer is decreasing with increased HPV vaccination rates. And the last knowledge check question we'll pull you guys with. HPV has a role in colon and rectal adenocarcinomas. Okay, so um, thank you for participating and, and cre uh, adding some interactive in the chat. We're gonna circle back through these and then Dr. Nickerson will also be addressing these through his presentation. But we just ask that you uh, mute your mic at this time and captioning is available through Zoom. However, please note that the captions are unofficial and may not reflect the exact dialogue. Uh, any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat box. Um, and then if you have any difficulties, uh, you can message one of us, uh, the um, presenter, uh, Janae or myself. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce today's speaker and topic. Um, we welcome Dr. Paul Nickerson. Uh, he is a colorectal surgeon in Roanoke and is affiliated with the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. 
Uh, he received his medical degree from University of Alabama School of Medicine and has more than 10 years of experiences in colorectal surgery and is experienced in colorectal oncology and general gastroenterology surgery. Um, so we're really excited to have you on board with us this, uh, the, today, Dr. Nickerson, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm gonna try to steal the screen. And I don't know when I became computer illiterate, but it was sometime in 2020. <laughs> Excellent. Can everyone see? Yes. So today um, we'll talk about HPV, its epidemiology and implications in an area that is near and dear to my heart and profession, colorectal cancers and anal cancers. As far as disclosures, again, I still have no financial disclosures, which is unfortunate for me, but uh, good for uh, CME purposes. Um, in the evident, in the um, spirit of pure um, transparency, I was planning to give this talk at the HPV Summit in the fall of 2020, which was uh, indefinitely postponed due to a COVID pandemic. And special thanks to my prior partner at UT MD Anderson, Craig Messick, who got me started down this road and shared a lot of his data and research with me early in my career. Our objectives is we'll discuss the um, basic characteristics of the human papillomavirus and transmissibility of the virus. We'll look at the terminology of the diseases that it causes specifically in the anus um, and to understand the significance of and management strategies for the anal diseases such as anal dysplasia. We'll review anal cancer and we'll review colon and rectal cancer and the implications of HPV um, in these disease processes. Looking at some of the chat uh, responses to my true false questions, I don't think I'm gonna really teach anybody anything today. It looked like everybody got all the questions right, but we'll go through it anyways. The papillomavirus is not a new thing. It's about 350 million years old, but fortunately humans haven't been around that long. Um, there's about 60 non-human strains still in existence, uh, mammals, snakes, turtles, and birds. There's about 150 human strains, of which 40 seem to like our mucous membranes, such as the anus. The five genera that we uh, have identified thus far, alpha, beta, gamma, mu, and nu, uh, only the alpha genre seems to pretend a cancer risk. These are the viruses that we are most familiar with are the viral subtypes, including uh, HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18. The rest may have some cancer risk, some skin cancer uh, risk, but it is very rare in the other genre. So what makes HPV so special? Well, it is small. It's an eight kilobase pair double-stranded DNA virus that's circular in nature. It is well packaged in its icosahedral supercoil um, packaging and it is epitheliotropic, meaning it really likes our epithelial surfaces. The largest organ in our body is our skin surfaces, so that does make us particularly susceptible. It is non-enveloped and it has a capsid, which makes it very tenacious and very transmissible. Enveloped viruses tend to be more susceptible to degradation in the atmosphere by light and oxygen and heat. So the fact that this virus has a capsid makes it resistant to those typical um, processes. The virus only codes for nine proteins, the seven early proteins, E1 through seven, and two late proteins, L1, L2. These are often overlapping and spliced to keep, it the, to keep the packaging small. The strains that we talk about are related to the L1 gene on the major capsid. Uh, this determines this, the subtype of the HPV virus. And uh, we know that certain subtypes have certain risks. Uh, the 6, 11, and uh, 16 subtypes are associated with condylomas, especially anal condylomas. And um, dysplasia or, or precancer and even cancerous lesions are related to the subtypes 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, and others. The genome itself is pretty, um, is, is, is pretty well organized. 
focus here on the early uh, number six and early seven proteins. These transforming proteins bind to very important uh, proteins in our own body, including the P53, the uh, universal tumor suppressor gene, and uh, retinoblastoma, which is the proto-oncogene. So by, um, by altering these two genes, it can lead to increased cellular replication and thus uh, transformation into a malignancy. So let's talk about epidemiology. Initially, we'll talk with some myths, some old teachings of HPV uh, transmission. So first of all, uh, an old myth is that you can only get it through anal receptive intercourse, at least anal dysplasia only occurs after anal, receptal inter anal receptive intercourse, or that it's really only in the HIV positive AIDS populations where we see anal uh, dysplasia and anal cancer related to human papillomavirus. Although these are associated with increased risks of viral, acqui of acquiring the virus and increased risks of anal cancer, these are not absolutely necessary for transmission and development of uh, HPV related anal diseases. Um, unprotected sex, the, you know, along an, an old teaching was if you use uh, barrier protection such as condoms, your risk of transmission is lower. And although this may help, it is not completely preventative for transmission of HPV. No symptoms means I'm not infected. Um, the virus, as we know, can lie latent like several other viruses that, um, that we deal with and, and can sit idly by and wait to strike when you least expect it. Uh, we only worry about the high risk types, the 16 and 18 oncogenic subtypes. Well, we think that that's not true either, although those do account for the majority of the cancers that we see. Low risk subtype does not mean no risk subtype. There's still a risk of um, viral transformation and cancer. Clearance is a touchy subject. What does it actually mean to clear the virus? Um, we think that it maybe incorporates into our DNA or lies latent in uh, within our cells. But so even if we don't have antibodies and the, you know, the serologic evidence of disease is no longer present, it's unlikely that we've actually cleared the disease. And of course, not me. It won't happen to me. Um, although it is unlikely that any one of us listening in on this Zoom call will die from anal cancer, uh, but the majority of anal cancers that we're seeing, or at least the highest increasing rate of anal cancers, are in patients without any of the risk factors. So I'm not sure if um, Nessie had uh, human papillomavirus, but I'm pretty sure that Bigfoot did. We talk about transmission methods. So direct transmission is the most common way that the virus is spread. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the United States and most likely in the world. We won't argue with that fact. And the disease is most commonly transmitted sexually through direct contact. Um, again, won't argue with that fact. This is the direct contact or the direct transmission method of acquiring the virus. And it is likely that everyone has been exposed at some point. However, it is possible that direct contact through non-sexual contact can spread this virus between hosts, and we'll evaluate that a little more. Some studies have looked at whether or not the virus can be transmitted vertically from mother to infant. The first report in the medical literature of an infant born with respiratory papillomatosis was in 1956. Since then, a few studies have been done in Korea and Finland and Canada. And there's a lot of data on this page, but what I want you to focus on is that in these cases, they demonstrated some evidence of vertical transmission from mother to infant. And all of these infants in this study were born through C-section. So passage through the birth canal is not necessary for vertical transmission either. Apparently the virus is small enough that it can Across the placental barrier and enter the fetus. Uh, the good news is, is that maternal antibodies can also cross the placental barrier 
And although the infants are exposed, it does not necessarily mean that they are all going to die of a HPV-related cancer. Indirect transmission is a newly um, evaluated possibility for viral transmission as well. Fomites and inanimate objects and the sloughed squamous cells. If the virus incorporates itself into the host DNA uh, or into the nucleus as an episome of DNA, um, it can live on in those squamous cells once, once sloughed as an extra layer of protection between that and the capsid of the virus. And this was uh, part of this was looked at at the NCI in the in the late 90s as well as to how resistant uh, HPV as a capsid is to desiccation. So they looked specifically at the uh, HPV 16 subtype as a capsid and um, various methods of killing the virus uh, and looked at day days one, three and day seven and reported viral um, uh, uh, the virulence of the virus. So left at room temp sitting on a desk or a table. Uh, day one still 100% virulent sitting in its capsid. At day three, 47 and day seven, uh, still 31% uh, capability of infecting a new host, just sitting on a hard surface. Heated to 65 degrees was pretty good. It killed over 80% of the viruses at one hour, but did not kill them all. Uh, using EDTA killed uh, none of the viruses. 70% <laughs> ethanol was very effective, so using hand sanitizer maybe will be a good idea even after the COVID pandemic. Um, nearly all of the viral capsids were eliminated through the use of 70% ethanol. And autoclave, so what we do uh, with our surgical instruments after, um, after doing a procedure, 100% uh, of the viruses were destroyed. One of the things that, you know, that makes this interesting to me is that colonoscopies, colonoscopes are not autoclaved. Uh, they are treated with an ethanol based uh, mixture at one point, but the predominant method of cleaning is through an enzymatic wash, which breaks down organic material. And to date, I haven't seen a good study that really determines how effective that is against um, the HPV virus. And we'll look at that a little bit later as well. Um, in general, the half-life of the virus is about three days in the open atmosphere, but it could be longer and it could certainly live longer in the sloughed uh, squamous cells. So what's the prevalence of this disease process? If we look at cervical cancer, here's a map showing the, um, you know, the number of new cervical cancer cases per year worldwide. S cervical cancer um, is highly associated with the human papillomavirus with over two thirds of cases being related to HPV 16 and 18. So unless you live in Greenland, um, you know, there is, a, there is still a high prevalence of HPV uh, in the community. One of the best studies to look at the uh, incidence of HPV, and I haven't seen a, a, a better single study done um, since 2008, this was the uh, HPV um, prevalence in males study or the HIM study and they looked at almost uh, 1200 healthy HIV negative males with no high risk features, no symptoms, no prior vaccinations and those not entertaining the prospect of uh, anal receptive intercourse. And somehow they convinced these men to um, uh, to allow them to perform penile swabs and obtain human papillomavirus DNA uh, through PCR testing. So over 65%, almost two thirds of people without a single risk factor or symptom were positive for HPV. And the majority of these were positive for multiple viral uh, subtypes. Some of which were oncogenic, some of which were what we believe to be non-oncogenic. They didn't evaluate for dysplasia in this particular study, but it still demonstrates the overall prevalence of the disease in the community. And uh, recently the CDC released a statement, um, uh, which is quoted in red, HPV is so common that nearly all sexually active men and women get, and I added the parentheses, they are exposed to the virus at some point in their lives. 
whether they will develop symptoms, whether they will develop problems, uh, whether they will go on to develop dysplasia or cancer, as we'll talk about that a little bit more. But nearly everybody is exposed to the virus at some point. This was uh, further expanded on in several um, national health and nutritional evaluation survey studies where seroprevalence was uh, detected pre-vaccination, so in the 90s, and then post-vaccination in the late 2000s, 2010s. And uh, the initial vaccine, the four-valent or the, the quadrivalent vaccine was available in 2006 and extended to males in 2009. And when they looked in the uh, 2011 to 2013 time period, the seroprevalence of subtypes covered by the vaccine were noted to decline in the post-vaccine era. Some of this suggests that vaccination works and the other you know, potential is herd immunity by vaccinating women less men were, were uh, obtaining the virus as well. The overall rates of HPV vaccination are okay, and that's kind of why we're here and involved in this task force. Um, we'd all like to see these numbers be a, a little bit higher. Virginia, not doing so great, at least as of 2016. I'll have to find some newer data uh, for the next talk, um, but we were sub 55 percent. Um, highest, uh, highest vaccination rates being in California, New York, uh, New England in general. So despite vaccination rates anywhere from 55 to 75 percent across the U.S. and a decreased incidence in cervical cancer, anal cancer is still increasing at a rate of about two to three percent per year. And the incidence of HPV related oropharyngeal cancer also seems to be increasing um, similarly. This may suggest a delay in the efficacy um, if anal cancer is pr primarily affecting older uh, generations in their 60s uh, that we haven't had time to catch up to the vaccination yet. Um, it could suggest some gender differences as well, or hopefully uh, we won't find that there's new oncogenic subtypes that are not being covered by the by the Gardasil vaccine. Currently, Gardasil is recommended for all persons under the age of 45 um, based on new CDC uh, guidelines and based on these increasing, uh, these persistently increasing incidences of non-cervical cancer. And when we look at HPV and related cancers, um, you know, uh, as, as a colorectal surgeon, I'm mostly interested in the risk of anal cancers. Uh, but these areas of the body all have a lot in common, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. These are all transition zones where the, um, where the embryological endoderm meets the ectoderm where the lining of the GI tract or bladder um, meets the uh, epithelialized outer layer. These are all areas of high cellular turnover and multiple cell types present in the area. Um, so they're ripe for viral inoculation and, um, and incorporation into rapidly dividing cells. I also say that, um, what is it, five out of the six of these are all very close neighbors of uh, the anus and the, and it would seem to be pretty uh, easy how the virus could spread directly. Um, when we think about synchronous disease, there does seem to be a high risk of anal cancer and anal dysplasia in the cervical cancer and vulvar cancer population. It's over 22 times the general population risk, um, especially cervical P16, sorry, cervical HPV16 almost a 40% risk of concurrent anal uh, dysplasia in HPV-16. What hasn't been determined yet is should we be screening these patients? My personal opinion is yes, and there's some ongoing studies um, out, of the, out of the university, or sorry, out of MD Anderson, looking at collaborative studies and the incidence of, uh, to, to further evaluate who should be screened in this in this setting. The highest risk group is the HIV positive and or immunocompromised groups that have a uh, almost 50 times increased risk of developing anal cancer over the general population. 
The idea behind this being that the immunocompromised groups can't suppress the human papilloma virus as well as uh, the general population. And in these subsets, routine screening is advised. Routine screening would be anal cytology similar to a pap smear can be done in the office looking for atypical squamous cells in the anal canal and then proceeding from there to a surgical evaluation such as a high resolution anoscopy to rule out the presence of any dysplastic lesions. So when we talk about a human papillomavirus in my world, the colorectal surgeon, we're mostly talking about anal cancer. To understand that, we'll have to review a little bit of anal anatomy. And I did steal this slide from Mr. Netter um, a while ago. Specifically, we're looking at the anal transition zone. So the most proximal anal canal is lined by columnar epithelium, similar to the rectum in the colon. The squamo-columnar junction is the dentate line and extending above and beyond this approximately two centimeters is the anal transition zone, marked by this uh, blue circle here. Beyond that, anoderm, which is, um, which is squamous non-keratinized epithelium, and that extends out beyond the anal verge, uh, becomes um, regular perianal skin when you see the presence of sweat glands and, um, and hair follicles. So the main area of concern is the anoderm and the anal transition zone. Um, when we talk about the mechanisms of infection, there's a classical understanding and some other methods as well. Our, you know, our classic understanding is that anal sex results in exposure to the live virus. There's an acute infection process where a break in the mucosa at this anal transition zone allows the virus to directly enter the body. It penetrates through the um, squamous layer into the basilar and parabasilar cells, and, and that's where it incorporates itself in and does its damage. That chronic infection leads to DNA entry into the, nucle into the nucleus and immortalization of the viral DNA. And a more modern understanding is that any direct contact with virus-laden um, cells, tissue, uh, even just the capsid enca you know, encapsulated DNA, uh, viral DNA laying on a table or a toilet seat could lead to inoculation with the virus. Um, the early protein 4 is associated with uh, keratin filament disassembly, and this can then release the host proteases and release the virons so that they can spread throughout the cell and neighboring cells. And then again, instead of a direct injury, it spreads cell to cell until it can incorporate into the parabasilar and ba basilar cell DNA, leading to this chronic infection and cellular uh, immortalization. And an alternative method is that the capsids are picked up by cellular filiopodia and are transported in between the cells uh, through to the basals, basal cell layer in the anal transition zone and sets up chronic DNA, uh, uh, chronic infection in that method. Um, this method has been proven in other viruses, so there's no reason to suspect that it couldn't happen in HPV as well. When, when we talk about anal disease, there's a lot of terminology and a lot of counterintuitive things, and, uh, and this next section will be an attempt to clarify um, some of this. Our previous terminology, uh, Bowen's disease, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, anal dysplasia, one, two, or three, or lower high grade, anal epithelial neoplasia, squamous cell intraepithelial neoplasia, low-grade or high-grade anal intraepithelial neoplasia. And the reason I bring this up is these all refer to the same thing, and there's a lot of different ways of saying it, but it is confusing. It confuses patients. It confuses providers. Uh, in fact, uh, it, you know, if you're told that you have a carcinoma in situ or an intraepithelial neoplasia, that scares enough people to, to um, worry that they actually have a cancer instead of a cancer precursor. When we reviewed a SEER database in, uh, I can't remember exactly when, it was in the 2000s, we reviewed a SEER database um, about the number of patients with any of these disease terms and what their treatment were. 
Um, up to 25% of patients with a precancerous lesion were treated with chemo or radiation for this disease. And to me, that seems a little unusual, and it's probably due to no, uh, mostly due to the nomenclature. In an effort to clarify this, the American College of Pathologists um, undertook a project called the Lower Anogenital Squamous Terminology Project. So looking at cervical dysplasia, penile dysplasia, uh, and anal dysplasia uh, disease processes, all of which we now believe are related to, um, in some way, HPV. And they decided that, you know, this is confusing. Let's, let's make it simple. For a pathologist, they're delivered a piece of tissue. They can tell that it's a, a piece of squamous mucosa, so they'll call it a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion or high-grade squamous epithelial lesion. And based on immunohistochemistry for a P16 stain to differentiate high-grade versus low-grade. It's up to us, the clinicians, then to labor to label it as anal low-grade so as low-grade uh, anal intraepithelial neoplasia, because we know where the tissue came from um, specifically, or cervical, um, you know, CIN, AIN, those terminologies are more the clinical terminology. And uh, as you can see, although the pathologists adopted this in 2001, the colorectal surgeons, it took us about 15 years longer to come on board, but eventually we did. The now have a lot of information in the uh, colorectal literature, specifically related to anal and colorectal diseases, uh, because we're kind of late to this game. So we've, you know, borrowed a lot of information from uh, the gynecologist and cervical cancer, which is the most studied uh, HPV-related disease process to date. And there seems to be um, this time period where you go from a normal cervix to acquisition of the virus and HPV detection that can you can essentially clear the disease by having a normal appearing cervix after detecting um, the viral uh, DNA without without necessarily requiring any intervention and whether that clearance is the body's ability to you know clear antigen presenting cells whether or not that represents true clearance is still to be you know determined from there, you can go to seropositivity, where antibodies are detected in the bloodstream. You can also progress to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, um, or you can regress back to, you know, a normal appearing cervix. It can lead to a latent infection, and left unchecked, it can proceed and, um, and progress into cancer. The schematic representation shows going from a normal appearing cellular layer to increasing air, you know, increasing degrees of dysplastic cells. And eventually when those dysplastic cells penetrate through the basement membrane is when you develop an invasive carcinoma. And we believe that this process is uh, essentially the same thing that happens in the anus uh, as well as in the cervix. So exposure outcomes. Um, Antigen, you know, presentation can lead to clearance, can be incorporated into the nucleus as, a, as an episomal DNA, remain latent. It can integrate into DNA, and if it integrates into coding regions of our DNA, well, that's where I think we get into the biggest problems. And this cumulative molecular and genetic mutations over many years in these highly actively dividing cells is what eventually leads to the dysplastic and then the neoplastic process. When we look at the prevalence of high-grade squamous lesions in anal canals of high-risk patients, our highest risk group is HIV positive, and it seems to be men uh, more so than women. And that's probably a combination of anal receptive inter intercourse as well as an immunocompromised state. Anywhere as high as 90% of men who are HIV positive in practice, um, anal receptive intercourse, will have high-grade anal dysplasia. Women, for women, that number seems to be significantly lower, um, with a range between 15 and 30 percent. Transplant recipients, there's not a lot of data available to, um, to evaluate 
these patients, but anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of transplant recipients have evidence of high-grade anal dysplasia. Um, the low-grade squamous uh, dysplasia seems to be much lower, at least the rates seem to be much lower, as low as 15 percent. But the data isn't perfect. It's really only presented uh, or reported in the high-risk groups. Uh, nobody seems to be doing a lot of anal swabs or uh, anal procedures for dysplasia on patients without symptoms and without um, high-risk uh, high history. Once we find it, what are the treatment options? Well, there's a lot of treatment options. Um, available. And what I want to point out here is that although there are multiple treatment options, um, they all have very high recurrence rates and they all uh, seem to have some evidence of effectiveness. They often require multiple sessions to clear the disease and we really don't know what disease clearance really means. So when we study this, the, the only thing that really seems to make a difference in progression from low grade to high grade or from high grade to cancer is frequent examinations and intense surveillance. In the non-high risk patients, um, there's not a ton of data available. Now, this report was a 10 year experience with 437 patients, all, <coughs> excuse me, 437 patients in total of which only 42 patients were non-high risk, so not HIV positive and not immunosuppressed. Followed over 10 years, one patient progressed to cancer despite therapy. Um, I skipped, a, somehow I skipped a slide there. Okay, I think I'm back on track. Similar study out of MD Anderson uh, with less follow-up, although I'll have to see if Dr. Messick has any more uh, updated numbers for me. Again, 41 patients, two-year follow-up, two patients progressed to cancer despite multiple treatments. And this data uh, just shows you how, um, how widely varied the treatment options are. Multiple treatment modalities, combination of therapies, multiple recurrences, and still the overall rate of transformation into cancer is, uh, is quite low. So if we look at a treatment algorithm for high-grade anal uh, lesions, um, again, this is mostly stolen or borrowed from cervical literature. And although it's, we do have some data available, we don't have a lot of quality data. So the majority of this is based on expert opinion. Um, if you have an abnormal cytology on a screening exam, uh, or if you do cytology on a high-risk patient, what do you do with it? On a high-risk patient, normal cytology gets a repeat cytology in 12 months. Insufficient tissue gets a repeat cytology. Atypical squamous cells, uncertain significance. I lost it again. Um, often these patients will then proceed to high-resolution anoscopy, to evaluate for the presence of dysplastic lesions. And if we can identify high grade or low grade anal dysplasia on cytology, those patients go to high resolution anoscopy. And that seems to be a pretty safe and cautious approach to dealing with these, uh, to dealing with these lesions. When you look at the numbers, <clears throat> I've already told you that everybody has been exposed to human papillomavirus. So the real question is, what's the overall risk? How many of us listening to the Zoom talk are going to get it? They're going to get an anal cancer. Um, in 2018, we had about 8,700 new anal cancers. I think the new uh, number will be projected to be closer to 10,000 for 2020. Um, if you subtract out the anal cancers caused by high risk population, um, that means that about 3,000 cancers, maybe 3,500 cancers, will be caused by high uh, by oncogenic HPV subtypes, 16 and 18, um, in the normal patient, the standard human population. Uh, in 2018, there were 30, 327 million Americans. Subtract out the high-risk population, 
and divide that number by 3,585, that means that 0.0015% of non-high-risk patients in the United States developed an HPV-related anal cancer. So the virus has been around for a long time, and we seem to have found a way to cope with it, to suppress it, to manage it. Only in the high-risk patients, immunocompromised or HIV-infected patients, does it seem to become a major problem. After today's Zoom call, I'm starting to feel like this person, a little bit ancient. Um, when we look at colon and rectal cancer in HPV relations, Colon and rectal cancer is still the third or fourth most common cancer in the United States across men and women. And it'll affect anywhere from 150 to 200,000 new Americans every year. The classical understanding of colorectal tumorigenesis was proposed in the 90s by uh, Vogelstein. And you see the progression the, in, the adeno, uh, in the adenoma carcinoma sequence with one of the late transformations being P53. And why did that go away? And the E6 protein of the oncogenic HPV viral subtypes, uh, we know interferes with uh, P53. So it is possible that a human papillomavirus infection could facilitate tumor genesis in colorectal adenocarcinomas. This is a relatively new area of study because uh, so far we've thought that HPV is mostly related to anal cancers, especially anal squamous cancers. Um, and we didn't, we still don't have a very clear understanding of how it interacts with the colonic mucosa, which are columnar cells instead of epithelial cells or squamous cells. So when we look at colorectal tumors, the Probably the largest meta-analysis was done in 2014 by a Dutch group. Uh, looking at 40 studies, they looked at um, studies uh, that had uh, tumors removed, so over 2,600 adenocarcinomas removed from the colon and rectum, and were tested for the presence of HPV based on PCR. Only 12 of these studies included colorectal control tissue, so it makes the data a little bit difficult to fully interpret, and the range is quite wide. So they found the prevalence of HPV in colon or rectal adenocarcinomas to be anywhere from 0% to 84%. Well, that's a pretty, pretty wide range. And when they pulled the data, they found that overall it was about 15% of these tumors had evidence of HPV within the tumor. Again, it's hard to it's hard to know what to do with that because there was not a lot of control tissue, meaning they didn't test the normal healthy uh, colonic mucosa near the tumor uh, for the presence of HPV. Um, and in this study, there was a trend towards an increased uh, incidence of HPV in rectal tumors, rectum being much closer to the anus uh, than the colon. And this argues for a retrograde transmission of viral uh, capsids from, you know, from infected anal mucosa um, that it can retrograde, that it can be passed retrograde up into the rectum and infect rectal tissue, and perhaps even further up into the colon and infect colonic tissue. Um, there didn't seem to be a difference between proximal colon and distal colon. Um, proximal colon being even further away from the anus and the rectum versus distal colon being the next step beyond the rectum. So it's unclear what to make with the incidence of colon-related uh, HPV disease. Uh, a Russian meta-analysis that came out a little bit later was a little bit more finely controlled in their studies. They again used PCR-based studies, um, looking at a total of 19 studies that only included tissue from both the tumor and the normal healthy control tissue to look at the differences in HPV infection in the tumor versus normal healthy mucosa. Out of this, they got over 2,000 adenocarcinomas and found that in the cancer tissue, about 16% were found to have HPV uh, viral DNA. 
And in the healthy control tissue, only 3% had HPV viral DNA, um, which is interesting that that number is so close to the earlier meta-analysis number of 15%, and that the control um, tissue has a much, much lower rate of harboring viral, uh, the papillomavirus DNA. And those two studies, you know, suggest that somehow the virus is transmitting itself from the anal region up into the rest of the colon. It seems to be a very low portion of colon tumors, only 15%, but it's still a significant number. And it kind of comes back to my previous statement about colonoscopies. Are we the ones who are transmitting the disease further up by uh, in inadequate cleaning techniques? I still haven't seen a, a study looking at specifically at HPV virus uh, on colonoscopes. However, the, the standard cleaning methods are, you know, are reported to kill over 99% of viruses and bacteria. So I have to wonder if they're still getting the HPV uh, despite this. And this is truly just retrograde transmission from an infected uh, or a, uh, an active uh, production of virus from a person's anal canal. But we still don't know is the rate of anal HPV in those patients who have colon cancer with HPV in it. So that would be an interesting study in my mind. So in summary, we still have some work to do. We know more than we did, but we still don't know everything. Transmission is simple. It's simple enough. There's a a bunch of variable, variable mechanisms, but really you just need direct contact with the viral capsid. Uh, multiple mechanisms can lead to chronic infection. Simplifying the terminology should make it a little simpler for the rest of us to keep up with this. And although the management is complex, there's a multitude of treatments available with relatively equivocal outcomes. Treatment of high-grade uh, lesions and high-grade dysplasia likely prevents progression to anal cancers, and frequent surveillance is um, is key. There does seem to be a moderate, modest association with colon and rectal cancer, and the mechanism is still undefined. Hopefully, vaccination vaccination will eradicate this process. Um, and this is the new uh, picture of the new nine-valent uh, Gardasil vaccine. Although I think in this uh, in this day and age, we're a lot more worried about a, another vaccine uh, than the Gardasil vaccine. But hopefully, this one will become uh, will come back to the forefront in the very near future. Collaborative studies that I briefly mentioned earlier. Oh, is this not going to load for me? Oh, there we go. Collaborative studies looking at the prevalence of anal dysplasia or anal cancer in women with. Uh, cervical, vaginal, vaginal, and vulvar dysplasia. I anxiously await um, Dr. Schmeller and Messick's data on this to know if we have any any improvement in our recommendations for screening um, the anal canal of women with HPV-related disease. Um, also, in uh, looking at the relationship between oropharyngeal uh, <coughs> cancer <coughs> and in stem cell transplant patients. So these will all be very interesting studies um, in the future. Uh, I guess at this time we can open it up for any questions. Uh, this is me and my family uh, socially distancing um, in the in the spring this uh, earlier this year, and and um, thank you all for having me. Thank you. I Steve. guess I need to stop sharing my screen at some point now. That's fine. Or you can look at your beautiful family. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing those. We do have, um, we want to thank you, first of all, Dr. Nickerson, for um, for presenting to us and sharing us, sharing with us so much important data and really just a different perspective. I think um, just hearing more details about that colorectal cancer, anal cancer piece and HPV is something that is kind of new to a lot of us uh, in, in this conversation, in this arena. So thank you so much for bringing your expertise and, and, um, and engaging with us. And we do want to turn it over to any questions that you guys may have. Um, you're welcome to come off mute now or 
or you can put them in the chat box as well. And I think we have a few that were um, sent in or queued up for us as well. Hello, um, my name is Nixon Arauz. I am a doctoral student um, in the Department of Health Behavior and Policy um, at VCU. Um, and I'm interested in uh, understanding um, cancer among Hispanic Latino males as, as it relates to HPV related cancers. Um, so my question um, to you, um, doctor, is to, um, I was wondering if you have any like, you know, demographic data um, that breaks down um, this information on susceptibility um, or further work is needed uh, to further understand how um, these, these things manifest in different populations? Thank sure, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I would refer you to the CDC website. Um, they have the data from the NHANES uh, studies, which was looking at seroprevalence in young adults in America, and they do have data uh, subdivided down into different racial um, and socioeconomic categories. So off the top of my head, I don't know it, but I think that the CDC website is would be a, um, a good resource for that. Thank you. To piggyback off that um, a little bit, I unfortunately had a friend pass away at 31 from colorectal cancer. Um, and I was just curious, is there um, a prevalence in minority communities or is there potentially some overlap in terms of testing or access to care uh, in terms of incidence in uh, colorectal cancer? For colorectal cancer specifically, we do see a earlier onset of disease and a higher prevalence of disease in the African-American population. And that has led to change in task force recommendations to start screening at age 40 um, for African-American individuals for colon and rectal cancer. As far as HPV related to um, I guess HPV population related, I don't know the specifics on, on whether or not it's higher in the African-American population and if that could be contributing. I believe that it is most likely a multifactorial process um, where several, you know, intermixing factors are, are create, you know, are, are joining to create a higher risk in that population. Thank you for um, addressing those. I was curious also too, and maybe we just need more time and data to, to, or more time to evaluate this data, but just curious with the added recommendation for HPV vaccinations for males, um, I wonder how long will it be until we see that kind of uh, bounce into some of these additional or these extra cancers that we've now learned about or these additional cancers that we've learned about are uh, HPV related, similar to where, you know, where we're seeing maybe some um, changes in cervical cancer incidence in part because of HPV vaccination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, to see what happens in the next few years, maybe decades mm -hmm. on the incidence of anal cancers now that the vaccination age has been raised to 45. Um, without giving you too much information about how old I am, I just missed the cutoff in 2008 um, for, for males to be vaccinated. So when the, when the guidelines were um, expanded in 2018, I was pleased that now I can at least have a discussion about the Gardasil vaccine, especially with the kind of work that I do. I feel like I would be at particularly high risk of getting it through surgical smoke or something like that. Um, so how long will it take for us to see a difference? I'm not really sure because we really don't know the timeline of this disease in the asymptomatic and low risk population. Um, 
hopefully within the next you know few to 10 years we may start to see a change in that with increased vaccinations yes i hope so Are there any other questions i see a comment hbb and the idea 18 Thank you for sharing that I was curious when you were talking about the um, in the research study where the gentleman had offered to do the penile swab or you know the uh, the testing that you said could be done and forgive me I don't remember the the technical term for the um, the anal swab just to test for HPV but is that something I'm not sure is that something that is offered as a screening to males and females similar to as we would be offered as a female. Uh, for a, a pap smear or cervical screening. Just curious for the male audience. The, yeah, the current recommendations are for office-based screening cytology, so similar to a pap smear, but of the anus. Uh, that is offered to anyone in the high-risk group, so HIV positive um, or even in, uh, you know, someone undergoing um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, someone with a partner with HIV. Um, I think it should be offered for women with a history of HPV-related cervical disease uh, because the, the risk seems to be fairly high, but it is currently not a standard recommendation. Okay. Very good. Well, um, if there are no other questions, I want to give everybody a, a few seconds to keep, you know, come off mute if they want, but we are at one o'clock and I did include um, Dr. Nickerson's email as well as VHIT's email in the chat box. If you, if we didn't get a chance to get to your question today, uh, we do encourage you to reach out and we will be uh, following up with the survey. If you could please um, complete that and, and submit it back to us, we'd love to learn from you more uh, as attendees for these presentations, more about what you'd like to learn and so that we can continue to build these uh, this session out. Um, but I will go ahead and, and close today. We have recorded today's session, so we will also be sharing that recording that you can um, share with your colleagues and hopefully get more providers and healthcare, provider, uh, healthcare professionals engaged. And just as a quick reminder, the next peer-to-peer -peer session will be the first Wednesday of March uh, on the 3rd with Dr. Bowen uh, to discuss dental collaboration and HPV. So another topic I think that we really need to dig a little deeper in understanding more in the community as well. So, uh, and then just a screenshot of our flyer. So thank you guys so much for joining us this afternoon. Dr. Nickerson, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing, uh, sharing some information with us. We really appreciate your, your input. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Have a great day, everybody.